We're going to continue our discussion on weather derivatives and specifically temperature options. Here we're going to do statistical analysis on temperature data here in Sydney over the last 150 years. We're going to look at this bimodal temperature distribution and look at the differences between weather and winter periods and maximum and minimums over given months. We're then going to use time series classical decomposition to be able to detrend and then remove seasonality from our data set. Once we do that we're going to use an autoregressive model, a time series model to be able to model the errors that we're left with. So just a quick summary of our goal of this series which is actually to price temperature options. Now a quick reminder that the underlying here is heating degree days and cooling degree days index over a given period. So these HDD and CDD indexes are based off the approximation of average temperature which in many places around the world is just the average between the observed maximum and minimum temperatures throughout the day. So for an individual day, we have an HDD of the T of the maximum of zero between the T reference temperature or base temperature minus this average temperature. And for cooling degree days, it's just the opposite. So the HDD and the CDD index for a given period N, for example, the winter period or the summer period is just going to be the summation of all those days HDDs the heating degree days or the cooling degree days over that given period. Now the option payoff is really only limited by the fact that it's based on this heating degree day or cooling degree day index. But other than that, let your imagination run wild. But example products that actually trade OTC are for example, the call with a cap. And this is the, the form where you take the minimum of a, a either the cap, commonly 500 or $1 million USD, and this average rate payoff for every heating degree day over a specified strike. Now, obviously it's opposite for the put. So with that goal in mind, let's move on to the data set that we're going to be using. Here in Australia, I live in Sydney and I'm really interested in actually doing a bit of a weather analysis of the Sydney data set. Now, the data set that I'm using is from BOM, the Bureau of Meteorology here in Australia. And here we can actually get data going back to 18. 59, which is pretty incredible. I've had to stitch two bits of data together. Looks like they've got a recent uh, weather station and update at the Observatory Hill. The link is here and in the description. So with those two weather stations in mind, I've stitched that data together, downloaded it from the website and then got the CSV files. Now the data available, essentially I've got maximum temperatures and minimum temperatures. Now, for um, those of you who don't live in Australia, Sydney is on the east coast of Australia in New South Wales. And if we zoom in, it's right near the Sydney Harbour Bridge. Observatory Hill is there. So we're going to be looking at these two weather stations um, at that location over the last uh, yeah, greater than 150 years. So let's import our dependencies. We've got uh, NumPy, Pandas, DateTime, and Matplotlib. Here, I'm just going to reference where I've downloaded those maximum temperature and minimum temperature files. And essentially, here's what one of them looked like. I've got product code, a um, bomb station number, so that, that weather station number. I've got years, months, days, maximum temperature. This is the column that I'm interested in, and then the quality of the data. Now, because this data set is so large and goes back so many years, it's good to check for missing data. So. If I have missing data for one, the max temperature, or the minimum temperature, then I'm not going to be able to compute my average temperature um, within that specific day. So we'd have to remove that row completely. So uh, I'm checking for nulls here, and here we've got true, uh, 153 for the max and 153 for the min. But like I just said, these might not be occurring on the same day, which is annoying. So uh, I asked myself the question, are these occurring on the same day? And what we can do, we can just zip um, these two uh, data frames where this is null. And I want to return back uh, if these are occurring at the same points. And we, in fact, find out that 41 of the 153 missing data points do not occur on the same day. So that's annoying. I'm just going to have to remove all those rows after I make the um, transformation of that average temperature. So here I've got a bit of code that I've um, created and cleaned up the max and min temperature data frame. Remember, I'm only interested in the maximum temperature column and the minimum temperature column, and then the actual date. 
So I change everything to date times, I apply that change to the data frames, set the index as date, uh, drop all the other columns, and then what I'm going to do is rename the maximum temperature column and minimum temperature columns to Tmax and Tmin. Then I can join the two data frames and I join them as an inner on left and right on both the date indexes. Once I've done that, I can use a function uh, average temp and that's just going to take the row Tmax and uh, Tmin and divide it by two. And then once I've done that, now I'm going to drop all rows on NA values. And remember, I have to do that because if I didn't have one particular temperature for a min and max, I am not going to have a correct uh, average temperature. So once we've done that, our data frame looks like this and I've got dates, Tmax, Tmin and temperature. To look at some general statistics about this, we can look at uh, the describe function from pandas. This gives us a count on all the rows of data. So, you know, nearly 60,000 rows, uh, daily information of temperature, which is crazy. We can look at the means of the Tmax, Tmin, and then average temperature, standard deviation, um, and then some of the percentiles and the min and max. Now, this min and max is pretty cool, but this is over the entire period. What happens if we want to uh, look down at particular months or uh, seasons to get a bit of better idea of what the max and mins have actually been? So first thing I'm gonna do, I'm going to indicate the winter and summer period. So here in Australia, I've got uh, winter being the period from May to October, and then summer from November to April. So I'm gonna do a deep copy on my temperatures data frame, and then I'm going to label um, a season as the month, which I'm just taking the index month. I'm then making a mask, which is uh, the specific temperature um, season of the months for winter, and then I'm applying a, that mask to my filter, making the indicator equal to one if it's winter, and then I just do the reverse for summer. Now, visualizing the data, here's just a time series plot of our three indicators, Tmax, Tmin, and temperature over the uh, plus 150 years. I mean, so it's not very useful. I can't really see any oscillations. So let's zoom in a little bit. I'll just look at the last uh, 5,000 um, or you know 12 year period. And here, what we've got is we can see in blue, our Tmax, Tmin is below, and we can see this huge cycles uh, and variation in the data. So let's take a better look at the temperature distributions. So for this, I'm going to be looking at uh, histogram plots. So here, our histogram plot of the Tmax is in blue, uh, Tmin is in uh, this orange color, and then we've got a bimodal distribution here for our average temperature. And what we can actually see is this bimodal distribution with two means, the means are actually centered and reflect the peaks of both the summer and winter months. And to show that, we can then uh, use our indicators for our summer and winter months, separate this distribution into two histograms, and show that over time, here is my uh, slightly negatively skewed distribution um, for the winter months, and then somewhat more normally looking distribution for the summer months. So interesting here to see that the temperature distribution um, in the Southern Hemisphere here is negatively skewed. So now I'm quite interested in seeing the temperature records that have actually materialized for particular months. And this is just um, satisfying a curiosity, but you could do it on whatever season you want. So let's first compile a list of min and max records for each month on record. So the way I'm doing this, I'm compiling a date list um, for my time series data frame. I then need to resample on the monthly starts and then I'm going to aggregate the min and max. Now, once I've done that, I can aggregate a data frame um, for each particular starting month with the min of that month and then the max of that month. I can then uh, create a index, which is going to be the month that that's on. So one through to 12 from January to December, and we can aggregate that on that later. Then we can uh, subsection our original data frame temps um, each time based on what month we're in. And here we're just going to take the uh, maximum temperature and we're gonna take the max of the maximum temperature observed and the min of the maximum temperature observed and then the max and min of the temperature min observed. We're also going to do this for our average temperature. 
So I know that's a bit confusing, but we're, yeah, essentially we're looking at the max and min that is observed within a particular month of the T max, the T min, and the temperature uh, profile. So let's take a better look at the temperatures extremes that exist on record now that we can group these seasons however we like. So we're going to look at the maximum T maxes and the minimum T mins, because obviously this is the most interesting. We're also interested in looking at the maximum T mins that were observed and the minimum T maxes. So here, this is like the maximum temperature that you might observe for a particular month. Um, you might be interested in seeing the maximum T min in the winter months. Once we apply that group by, we end up with a data frame like this. And interesting to see that the highest temperature on record that I can see for the Sydney Observatory is 45.8. And obviously you can go back through the data and look up where that occurred. Now the minimum temperature that I can observe um, that's happened on record at the Sydney Observatory is actually in the June period here at uh, 2.1. But it's important to know that uh, the min uh, temperature, the maximum of the min temperatures that have ever been observed during the height of the winter period um, for June is actually 18.4. So it's interesting to see these swings in the extreme temperatures um, over that well, 170 year period nearly. Now we're gonna look at our underlying, which is that average temperature indicator. So we're going to look at the maximum and minimum um, observed for uh, each individual month. We're also going to look at the maximum uh, T mins and the minimum T maxes. So this is our actual uh, underlying data, that average T, um, T, and we're interested in the maximum and minimums observed. So that's how you can compile it for different seasons. Now that we've looked at the statistics, let's jump into how to de decompose this using time series. So now we're actually going to model and do time series decomposition. So this is a technique that splits the time series into several components, each representing an underlying pattern in the data. So here we're gonna talk about trend, seasonality and noise. Now usually there's a third component called cycles, but this is actually going to be taken up in classical decomposition into the trend component. So really it's a trend and cycle component. So is the trend decreasing constant or increasing over time? What is the periodic signal for the seasonality and the noise? So the variability in the data that cannot be explained by the model, this is really the remainder. So by stats models seasonal decomposition, this is a naive decomposition used in Python and it uses classical decomposition. So what is classical decomposition? Well, essentially the additive model is of this form here. Again, we have our time series varying with T um, with our trend component, our seasonal component, and then our error term. So the algorithm is using a convolution filter on the data, the trend is removed, and then the average of this detrended series is uh, used um, for each period to actually return the seasonal component. The steps for classical decomposition are as follows. So here, um, for the trend cycle component over a given period M, so the period we're gonna define, uh, we can get a moving average term. Then we can take this away from our original time series to get the detrended series. The estimated seasonal components is then calculated by averaging the detrended values for that season. And in our case, this is gonna be every day within the year. So the seasonal component values are then adjusted to assure they add to zero. And then this remainder and error term is just calculated by subtracting the trend and the seasonality from our original data set. So we'll talk about the disadvantages of using classical decomposition position in a minute, but for now, let's import our dependencies. So from stats models, uh, let's import the AD fuller test, which is the unit uh, stationary uh, test. We'll import seasonal decompose. We'll use the plot ACF and plot PACF for uh, partial uh, autocorrelation functions and autocorrelation functions. Auto reg AR select order and then auto reg results. Again, our temperature frame is going to be, I'm just going to sort on the index, which is our date. And here's what it looks like. We've got T max, T min and temperature. Remember, we're only interested in temperature. Um, and then our date time series goes from January 1859 all the way through to today. 
Now let's just take a brief look at our data set. Here we have a clear upward trend in temperature over time. I've just taken a rolling window of 10 years, uh, got the mean and plotting that over time. And here you can see that uh, updrift over time. And I've also taken the variance over that time window as well. And you can see that uh, variance has definitely changed over that time period. So with that in mind, let's use our seasonal decompose function. So here we're going to use that additive model that we spoke about before. Um, we're going to pass in our time series uh, temperature of just T, that average temperature indicator. Now, because we have such a long time series uh, with what, something like 15 to, to 16 decades, um, I'm going to choose a moving average term uh, period here uh, of 10 years. Now, th this, this is kind of crucial for getting a bit of a smooth trend function. Um, but obviously, if you want to discretize a little bit more, you can uh, change that to 365. And I'll just show you actually what that looks like. So if we use 365, you can see that the trend series um, gets a lot of variability within that moving average over a one year period. Um, whereas we're kind of smoothing that out over a 10 year period and then more of the variation ends up in our residuals and our seasonal components. We've then taken the decomposed results and then we can break it down to a trend, our seasonal and our residual. Now that's just the composed dot plot that we're visualizing there, but let's <laughs> But because everything's so jammed up and there's so many seasonal patterns, to actually visualize that properly, let's look over a 10 year period. So here I'm just looking at the trend at the top, our uh, seasonality, and then our residual component. So the first thing that you're going to notice is the fact that there is this uh, ugly straight line at the end of our uh, data set and the reason that's there is because we've taken a 10 year moving average now This is a two-sided moving average which means it's taken five years at the end of the time series and five years at the start of the time series um, So there's no real moving average term that's actually calculated over those periods um, So what you can do is you can set it equal to the frequency and yeah, essentially it's just uh, extrapolation um, And that's what we've done, but that is actually one of the downsides that's uh, actually noted in the documentation on classical decomposition that I've given you in the link there. One of the other biggest downsides is the fact that you'll be able to see here, our seasonality component has captured a good five degree swing that's occurring every year. But you'll see here that there's kind of some really strong, what I would call autocorrelation in our uh, residual components, and we'll see that soon. But this looks like you could almost decompose that further into a seasonal component. Now the issue here is that classical decomposition function uh, looks over a specified amount of time and with that particular function that we're using there, it's always a one year period. Now that's kind of annoying because perhaps we have some peculiarities um, within our temperature series that means that we've actually got um, some other period or an offset uh, to our yearly seasonal function, which it looks like here. Our peaks are kind of occurring maybe, you know, 90 days or, or half a year um, beforehand in our residuals. So unfortunately, classical decomposition isn't really picking this up. Now, despite its limitations, we've got another methodology that we're going to be looking at later. So we're gonna roll on with classical decomposition. So before we do any time series um, decomposition on our residuals now, we need to confirm that this residual time series is actually in fact stationary. Before we do any uh, AR um, or armor models, let's perform the Dickey Fuller test. And essentially this is just a unit root test where the null hypothesis is that a unit root exists aka random walk. So essentially here, what we're going to do is test the last 5,000 data points um, and see uh, what the results are and whether it's statistically significant or whether we have enough information to determine um, whether a unit root exists or not. Now we've got our um, AD, uh, F statistic back and that's yielding a p-value of 0 0.00015 and that means that we've got enough statistical evidence to reject the null hypothesis that the unit root exists. 
Um, that doesn't mean that it doesn't exist, it just means that given our data set, uh, these are the results we've got. If you include all the data set, because we have 60,000 um, data points, uh, using the ADF uh, methodology, it gets extremely likely, um, according to the test, that uh, there is no uh, unit root existing here. The residual distribution here, I've got a histogram and essentially it looks really normally distributed. Um, however, we know that there is serious uh, autocorrelation. So yeah, the analysis of serial correlation or autocorrelation is just the correlation that occurs uh, in the errors in the residuals from one time point um, on itself. So what is the correlation between a time point in the errors um, now compared to the last moment in time, compared to the last day, and so on. So we're observing massive autocorrelation, positive autocorrelation, um, all the way up until really 90 days, and then after that it just turns negative. So exactly what this plot's showing is that we have huge seasonal um, relationships in our uh, residual terms over time. Now, obviously there's significant serial correlation here, and since the autocorrelation function does not seem to vanish after a number of lags, um, we are not going to try and fit a moving average term. Instead, we're going to try and determine um, the number of, or the order of the autoregressive model, um, and we're gonna do this by looking at the partial autocorrelation function and then the AIC uh, criterion. So first off, the partial autocorrelation uh, function Basically, instead of finding correlations of the present values of lags um, on all the data set uh, from different days, it finds the correlation of the residuals. So what do we mean by that? The residuals remain after removing the effect which are already explained by earlier lags. So uh, with respect to the next time lag, so here in the graph below, we've already found huge explanation through the first two lags, and that's not taken into consideration in the third lag term there. Whereas if you remove the effects of those first two, then you get our partial autocorrelation on the third one in our partial ACF function. So essentially, we remove already found variation before we find the next correlation. And here we can see that there's a significant partial autocorrelation in our first two days, and then it kind of decreases all the way to uh, 15 here, even 20. Now the archaic information criterion, so AIC, this is a single number score, and essentially this is just representative of model fit. And here we have two components. Um, so this term here is about fit, and this is using the log likelihood. And the likelihood is the maximum uh, likelihood um, estimator of the fit of a particular model. And K is just the number of parameters that that model has. So this is about judging parsonomy. Now what we're trying to do here is get the best fit without overcomplicating or overfitting the model. So as we increase the number of parameters, obviously the model gets more complex, but we want to optimize and get the best fit. So the way that we're trying to optimize here, we're using the AIC criterion to get the best fit um, that it kind of reduces the number of parameters. So we actually want the lowest AIC value we can, but within reason. So the best balance of model fit with generalizability, this is serving um, the eventual goal of actually maximizing our fit out of sample. So let's look at the residuals. Um, we're going to test the residuals on uh, a lag term up to 40 with our AR model, and we're gonna use the AIC model um, to actually sort on. So here in our graph, we can see uh, the AIC uh, value that actually decreases as we increase the number of lags that's included in our autoregressive model. And as you can see, as we get to 15, it goes down to about 1.26, and there's not really a huge decrease in the AIC after that. It goes down to yeah, 1.25 in our 20, and then even smaller decrease after we increase um, lags. So, I'm gonna make the decision here that we're gonna fit an AR model with 15 lags. Now we're gonna fit our autoregressive model with 15 lags, and we're gonna use the auto reg functions for that on the residuals, lags equals 15, and then we're gonna fit the model. We can then look at the params, um, the residuals, 
and we're going to most importantly look at the dot summary evaluation. So the most interesting row to look at is going to be our Z scores and then the probability um, of these Z scores. So essentially what we're doing here is the null hypothesis test. The null hypothesis test being that uh, this is uh, equal to, that the coefficient is equal to zero. And what we want to do is we, uh, if, we, if that's really powerful and we have statistical evidence to prove that that is not the case, then um, we would reject the null hypothesis at, a, diff at a, a given critical level. So what we have here is that the intercept has a probability of um, 89. So if we set our uh, critical value to say 5%, um, well then we cannot reject uh, the null hypothesis that this is statistically insignificant. So what we're gonna do is we're actually not going to include the intercept. So the way we do that is we just include trend um, n for, for no, and essentially then we get our other coefficients without the intercept. Now you'll see all the other, um, all the other p-values here for our uh, estimates over these coefficients are zero. So we have to reject the null hypothesis and say that they are statistically significant. And for such a large um, number of observations, um, and given the fact that uh, we need to capture this seasonality that is definitely present within the residuals, um, that makes a lot of sense to me. We also get uh, the percentiles of this estimate, um, which are shown here. So our coefficient estimates are here, our parameters that are estimates, and then the percentiles around those estimates are here. So taking a plot of what those residuals look like uh, um, after we take into consideration that AR15 um, model, well essentially now our residuals uh, look like this, um, but we can't really see much there. So let's zoom in on the last 200 data points and you can see this looks a lot more like a white noise process. Essentially now we have autocorrelation um, and partial autocorrelation functions that have z almost zero autocorrelation between um, different lags. And this is exactly representative of a white noise process. Obviously there are other tests um, that you can do to test whether it's a white noise process. We might go through that in uh, another video. Okay, so now that the serial correlation appears to um, have been captured within this AR model, now we have our trend component, we've got our seasonality component, and then we've got a model for our residuals, which is an autoregressive model with 15 lag terms. So in the next video, instead of using classical decomposition, we're actually gonna use Fourier series to represent our uh, seasonal component of our data set. So see you in the next one.